Welcome to Pediatric Videos for PeaceCases.com. Hello, my name is Chris Novak. I am an incoming pediatric resident at the University of Alberta and the Stollery Children's Hospital. Today's podcast is designed to give medical students an organized approach to the physical exam finding of leukocoria, or the abnormal red reflex in children. This podcast was developed with Dr. Natasha Pollock, a pediatric ophthalmologist at the Stolly Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, and to Dr. Mel Lewis, a general pediatrician and associate professor at the University of Alberta. The term leukocoria refers to a white pupil when examining the eye. In some cases, leukocoria may be grossly apparent or may be noticed by parents in photographs. However, it is often an incidental finding on physical exam. While leukocoria is not a common finding, it is a critical sign of vision and potentially life-threatening conditions, including cataracts, hemorrhage, and malignancies like retinoblastoma. Different causes of leukocoria can present from the neonatal period and all the way throughout childhood. Hence, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that all neonates have their red reflex examined before discharge from hospital, and then subsequently at all well-child visits. Thus, it's important for all physicians looking after children to recognize the critical nature of this presentation so that it's not missed. A late diagnosis may result in permanent vision loss. After listening to this podcast, learners should be able to, number one, review the anatomy of the eye, number two, demonstrate an approach to examining the right reflex in children using a direct ophthalmoscope, number three, develop a differential diagnosis for leukocoria based on anatomical structures, and number four, discuss the initial steps of management and referral for a child with leukocoria. So let's start with the case. You are a third-year medical student in your rural family medicine rotation. You're asked to go see Oliver, an 18-month-old male presenting to his family doctor's office for his extended well-child visit. Oliver had been well, and his parents really had no specific concerns on history. You proceed to your physical exam and take out the direct ophthalmoscope to examine Oliver's eyes. As you check for the right reflex, you're taken aback. One pupil is red like you would expect, however, the other is white. You recognize this finding as leukocoria. What is causing this finding, and should you be concerned? We will come back to this case as an example at the end of the podcast. The red reflex. Before we delve into the pathology of leukocoria, let's review some normal physiology and anatomy. The red reflex is a screening physical exam maneuver that uses the direct ophthalmoscope to transmit light through the transparent structures of the eye to the retina. These structures are important to understand to formulate your differential diagnosis, so let's review the anatomy briefly. The retina is a tissue lining the back of the eye where light is focused and converted to nerve impulses for vision. The retina is a highly vascular structure, so normally when you view it through an ophthalmoscope, it appears red. For light to reach the retina, it has to pass through a number of transparent structures, the tear film, the cornea, aqueous humor, the lens, and vitreous humor. The cornea is a transparent layer at the front of the eye that covers the iris, pupil, and other structures in the interior chamber. At its periphery, the cornea fuses with the conjunctiva, which cover the white sclera which form the shell of the eye. The anterior chamber is the space between the cornea and the lens, which is filled with aqueous humor, a transparent fluid similar to plasma. The lens is suspended at the back of the anterior chamber and can change shape in accommodation to focus light on the back of the retina. The rest of the globe of the eye is filled with a thick gel called vitreous humor. Opacity or distortion of any of these structures can lead to an abnormal red reflex. Now to check the reflex, take your ophthalmoscope and set the focusing wheel to zero and set the beam of light to the largest possible diameter. Stand at arm's length from the child and have them look at the light source using your voice or a toy. This can be difficult in a neonate. A few tricks are to dim the lights in the room to get them to open their eyes you can try to tilt the baby's head backwards and sometimes that'll work. Look closely at the red reflections in both eyes. A normal finding is two red pupils which are symmetric in character. Abnormal findings are the presence of a white pupil, asymmetry of the reflexes, markedly diminished reflexes, or dark spots in the retina. Diseases which cause leukocoria may be bilateral or unilateral, so symmetry does not necessarily rule out pathology. It takes practice to recognize what is normal and what is not, so get plenty of practice examining healthy patients. Differential Diagnosis Any abnormal findings on the red reflex suggest opacity of structures in the eye or distortion of light as it passes to the retina. So now, let's review the differential diagnosis by going through each one of these structures. 
First, light passes through the cornea and aqueous humor of the anterior chamber. Lucky for you, there are not really any common disorders of these structures that cause leukocoria. And really, that makes sense. These structures are anterior to the pupil, so any distortion of these structures would extend past the margin of the pupil and would not present with leukocoria at all. So, after going through the cornea and the aqueous humor, light hits the lens. The most important diagnosis to consider here is cataracts, the most common cause of leukocoria in children. Cataracts are an opacity of the lens of the eye, and while they are typically thought of as a disease of the elderly, they can present in neonates and young children. One third of congenital cataracts are genetic, with a family history of cataracts. One third are associated with systemic diseases like trisomy 21 or metabolic disorders, and the remaining third are idiopathic. In the developing visual system, anything that blocks light from reaching the retina can lead to irreversible vision loss through amblyopia, as the neural networks required do not develop appropriately due to deprivation. For this reason, the ideal age to operate on congenital cataracts is as early as six to eight weeks. After the lens, we move into the vitreous humor. The first condition we'll consider here is persistent fetal vasculature. Persistent fetal vasculature is a congenital anomaly where blood vessels in the developing eye fail to regress in development, leaving behind a vascular stalk extending through the vitreous from the optic nerve to the lens. Children with this condition tend to present with micropthalmia, or a smaller eye on the affected side, and are at higher risk of developing glaucoma, cataracts, and intraocular hemorrhage. Next, any cellular debris from hemorrhage, inflammation, or infection of the vitreous can also lead to leukocoria. In a vitreous hemorrhage, blood degrades into a white debris. Vitreous hemorrhage may result from persistent fetal vasculature, trauma, advanced retinopathy prematurity, or bleeding diathesis such as hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Infection of the vitreous can also cause leukocoria. An example of this is ocular toxocoriasis a thankfully rare systemic infection of roundworms of dogs and cats. Toxocoriasis is transmitted to humans when they ingest soil contaminated with dog and cat feces. Children are especially prone to ingesting soil due to hygiene and play habits. Once ingested, the larvae hatch, burrow into the intestinal wall, and migrate to various organs in the body. The roundworm larva has a predilection to deposit in the eye. In the early stages of infection, this leads to an inflammation of the vitreous called endophthalmitis. Later in the infection, it leaves behind white granulomas behind the retina. The mean age of presentation of toxocriasis is 8 to 16 years. However, this can present in children as young as 2 years. Treatment of toxocriasis involves use of oral anti-helminthic agents. Moving to the back of the eye, we hit the retina. Retinal causes of leukocoria can be divided into the conditions that lead to deposition of material behind the retina and those that lead to retinal detachment. Perhaps the most concerning cause of leukocoria is retinoblastoma, an intraocular malignancy which originates from the retina. It most commonly presents in early childhood. The median age of diagnosis of retinoblastoma is only 18 months, with 95% of all cases presenting before the age of 5 years. While the majority of cases arrive from de novo mutations, up to 10% of children will have a family history of retinoblastoma due to a heritable mutation of the RB1 gene. Children with a family history of retinoblastoma should have regular evaluation by an ophthalmologist due to an increased risk of developing malignancy. Leukocoria is the most common presentation of retinoblastoma, but children may also present with strabismus, nystagmus, or a red eye. Without treatment, retinoblastoma is a deadly disease which leads to destruction of the orbit, metastases, and death. Therefore, any child presenting with leukocoria should have an urgent referral to ophthalmology for dilated ophthalmic examination. Diagnosis is made by clinical assessment. With prompt therapy, retinoblastoma has a greater than 95% five-year survival rate. However, children who present with metastatic disease have only a 50% survival rate at 18 months. Therapy depends on tumor characteristics and prognosis, but can include chemotherapy, radiation, cryotherapy, laser therapy, and surgical removal of the eye called nucleation. Overall, this is a very treatable malignancy where the best outcomes come if the diagnosis is made as early as possible. Another disease of the retina that can present with leukocoria is Coats disease. Coats disease is an exudative retinal vascular disorder that leads to the deposition of lipids below the retina. 
This gives the retina a yellowish appearance on exam. Coats is more common in boys and in older children and usually presents between the ages of five and nine years. Eventually, Coates disease can lead to retinal detachment. Any cause of retinal detachment will present with leukocoria, as the red blood vessels associated with the retina are removed from the back of the eye. Causes of retinal detachment include trauma, advanced Coates disease, and severe untreated retinopathy of prematurity. Finally, there can be significant variation in the pigmentation of the retina in different ethnic groups. For example, the retina in children of Asian and African descent can appear much less red than Caucasian children. An experienced clinician can usually detect the difference. However, if you're in doubt, you should refer to ophthalmology for a more detailed exam. It is much, much better to make the mistake of referring a normal child than it is to risk not referring a child with a vision or life-threatening disease. To review, the causes of leukocoria include lesions of the lens, vitreous, and retina. The lens can be affected by congenital cataracts. In the vitreous, you can have persistent fetal vasculature, vitreous hemorrhage, or inflammation such as intoxocoriasis. On the retina, you can have retinoblastoma, Coats disease, or retinal detachment from a variety of causes. Estimates of frequency vary. However, the most common cause of leukocoria is generally cataracts, followed by retinoblastoma, persistent fetal vasculature, and Coats disease. There are other rare causes of leukocoria, however, these are probably more relevant for specialists. Referral. After discovering leukocoria on a physical exam, all children require urgent referral to an ophthalmologist experienced examining children and should be seen within one week. You should include in your referral a detailed medical history, including any associated systemic symptoms, any family history of ophthalmic disease, including retinoblastoma, and any other findings on a detailed physical exam. Communicate to the family the urgency of this referral that divides them with a wide differential from serious to benign causes and that they will require a specialist to take a closer look. Upon receiving the referral, an ophthalmologist can make a diagnosis through a comprehensive ophthalmologic exam and can make the necessary steps to begin treatment for the specific etiology. Now let's return to our clinical case. You have just noted leukocoria in Oliver's physical exam. After finishing the physical exam, you do a more detailed medical history and find out that Oliver has no associated symptoms and has no family history of ophthalmic disease, including cataracts or retinoblastoma. You report your findings to your preceptor, who confirms the presence of leukocoria. They explain to Oliver's family that one of his pupils appears white on physical exam, and that he should quickly be seen by an ophthalmologist in the nearest community. Oliver is diagnosed with early-stage retinoblastoma, devastating news for his family. He is quickly introduced to a pediatric oncology team and begins therapy. Thanks in part to his early diagnosis, he goes on to make a complete recovery. Before we leave, let's finish with a few take-home points. Number one, leukocoria is a rare physical exam finding that can be a signal of serious and treatable diseases. Therefore, all newborns, infants, and children should be screened with examination of the red reflex in all routine physical exams. Number two, the most common causes of leukocoria include congenital cataracts, retinoblastoma, persistent fetal vasculature, and Coats disease. Number three, all children with leukocoria require an urgent referral to ophthalmology for a dilated eye exam. This concludes our podcast. Thank you to Dr. Pollock and Dr. Lewis for working on this project with me, and thank you for listening to the Peds Cases podcasts. Check out www.pedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store. Share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.